We are continuing our study of Galatians today. And so we're doing Galatians chapter 3. We're getting started in it. And our title of the sermon today is Bewitched, Christ- Bewitched Churches. Bewitched Churches. Now, everyone under 40 in here doesn't really have any connotation of the word bewitched. They're like, okay, I hear witch in there, but I don't know what else it is. But everyone over 40, you are like, you think of this, right? You think of the TV show, right? So a young bride gets married, and then it turns out that her husband doesn't know, but it turns out she has, she's a witch, and she does magic in the household. So she, you know, she gets her chores done quite quickly and, and things like that, and uh, that's, that's what the sitcom was based on. So, you know, and it's kind of a play on words. You have to be bewitched as a, you know, it's kind of, it literally could mean to have a spell on you, but more figuratively, you know, she's in love, they're in love, they're a young couple, and they're going to have kids and things like that. So there's, there's different meanings to words. Today, we're going to look at a church that is, or churches that are bewitched. And so uh, verse 1 of chapter 3, and if you have your Bible, that'd be a great place to just keep your Bible. The other verses I'll put up on the screen, but for, for our main text today, we're going to be in Galatians 3, and it says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And so this idea of eyes that go with the bewitching, um, this, this goes back to a concept in, you know, 2,000 years ago of the evil eye. Like a sorcerer could, you know, kind of put the evil eye, if you don't look into the eye. Um, snakes were also known to be kind of have this magical power where they, if, if, they, if they got their, if a prey would, you know, a little bird or a little rodent would look in a snake's eyes, it would freeze. And then the snake could attack. And so we see that sometimes portrayed in our cartoons. It's kind of fun to kind of see. Well, not fun, but, you know, it's just kind of like it's funny to, to watch someone be hypnotized by the eyes. Uh, Mowgli in, in Jungle Book, he is, he is hypnoti- he, he's hypnotized by the snake, Ka. And then this is from Robin Hood. So if you get your eyes on the wrong thing, you can be hypnotized, you can be led astray. And so, so we're going to look at that today, that, that Paul's going to say Jesus should be the billboard in front of us. It, it should just be taking up the whole scenery. It should just be all that we can see, and that will keep our eyes in the right place. So part one, we looked at the history. We looked at who is Paul? Is he an apostle? We found out, you know, his, his credentials as an apostle, his his. Uh, the trouble in the church and how he dealt with that with Peter. And now this is beginning part two. And this is getting into more of the theology. Okay, what, what does it mean to be free in Christ? And then the last part will be chapter five and six. Um, chapter five and six will be more the ethics. So what does that mean? Now that we believe this, where does that take us? So we're going to look at three things today uh, as we go through these verses, chap- uh, verse one through nine of chapter three. We're going to see that they are saved by the Spirit. We're going to see that they are adopted by the Father, and we're going to see that they are redeemed by the Son. We're going to see all parts of the Trinity, um, our glorious truth about our God, that he is three persons uh, in one, uh, Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? God, open our eyes to see you for who you truly are, God, help us to see ways that we've taken our eyes off of you. God, we need you, and you love us, so we come to you now asking for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so saved in the Spirit. Read with me again, verse 1, and then we'll go to verse 5. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by the means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law, or by your believing what you heard? So Paul addresses his readers by name here, uh, the the, the people of this church by name, and he only does this four other times in Scripture. And that's interesting because he's mad. 
okay? You know, you whip out the name. Um, I remember when my, my kids were little, you know, you used the middle name when they were really in trouble. Did any of you do that, parents? You know, and I remember my, my middle son used to think that that was just like what you said when you were mad. So one time he put his middle name in with his brother's name. <laughs> he got so mad and said, Micah Daniel Murphy. And it was hilarious. But, you know, we realized what he was doing. He's thinking, whoa, you're getting my name out? This is serious. And so, and then, of course, it's also pretty, pretty serious when he calls them foolish, all right, so J.B. Phillips did a translation. I don't know if you've ever seen the Phillips translation, but just one man who said, I want to I put the, the kind of the spirit. It's not really a literal translation of the Bible, but, but the Phillips translation, he puts it in, in the spirit of the times, and he said, kind of like the message, but you know, he said, oh, you dear idiots of Galatia, surely you cannot be so idiotic, <laughs> right? It's just, it's just mind-boggling. What is going on here? You know, and as we think of this harsh kind of rebuke, we see this correction by Paul. We, we remember that love and rebuke are not opposites. Love and, um, and, and opposition, they're not necessarily, or correction, are not opposites. He's using this because they're in danger. He's, he's, he's speaking sternly, speaking uh, intensely to them because they are in danger and he's emotional about it and he needs to let them know that. And the word foolish in the original language, it doesn't mean someone who's not smart intellectually, and it doesn't mean someone who's just immoral either. It has this idea that you know something, but you're not using it. So it gets down to, you know, this church, they didn't, they didn't have low IQs, all right? They, they literally weren't um, unintellectual people, but they lacked discernment. It was discernment that they needed. So the first blank, if you have your bulletins with you, or if you're following along on the app, the first uh, blank there is discern what belongs in your Christian life and what does not. What belongs in my Christian life? And to make decisions and to keep the things out that are really not drawing me closer to God. They're really not um, you know, bringing, making me stronger in my, in my walk with Jesus. The Galatians were kind of like a baby. You know, if you've ever been around little babies, you know that there's that phase they go through where everything goes in their mouth. Right? Anything they can grab, it just goes in their mouth. And so, you know, it doesn't matter if it's mom's hair or if it's a Cheerio on the carpet or a potato chip in the yard, whatever it is, it'll go in their mouth. And so the Galatians are kind of like that. They're just like little babies. And they're just like, oh, this person says this. I'm going to believe it. Oh, this is on YouTube. I'm going to believe it. They didn't have YouTube. But, you know, I, I read this. I heard this. I saw this website. Somebody said this. And they just take it all in. They just take it all in. There's no discernment among them. And so the, the word of God needs to be our way of discerning. And our fellow believers in the church need to be our way of discerning. What should I put in my life? What should I allow into my life that's going to help me to grow? Verse 1 says, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. This is like billboard language. That's really what he's saying here. That when I was with you, Galatians, it was like a billboard in front of you. You, I, I just talked about Jesus, I talked about his life, I talked about our need for him, I talked about his death and his resurrection. It was like a billboard, it was huge. This was on display before your eyes. What has happened? How have you lost sight of that? And so we want to keep Jesus in front of us, as you see on your blank, like a billboard. Keep Jesus in front of us. It's why the church has two uh, ordinances, it has baptism and it has communion because they both are billboards for Jesus. Friday night, many of you were there. We had our, our um, family summer nights at Indian Hills Camp. And there's about 100 people there, great barbecue, but we did a baptism. And what do we do when we baptize people? We say, you're buried with Christ in his death and you're raised with Christ to new life baptism we do that and, it, and yes it's it's something you do once in your life but then it's something that you remember every baptism you go to and I just love those I love watching people get baptized because it reminds me of you know 1996 in Ocean Beach it reminds me of my baptism and you think to your baptism and you think yes God did this in my life and I I told the world that I believe and that I've I've been saved by Jesus and then communion Right? We have communion too. In about two weeks, we'll do our, our monthly communion service here. And what do we do? We keep Jesus in mind and we say, 
this was the body. This, this, this bread is his body. And, and he lived and then he died for me. And the blood that he shed for me is, is symbolic in that. And we just want to remember it. We want to remember it. It's who we are. His death and resurrection is the center of who we are as the church, as the church here in Hamul, as Christians. Galatians 2.20, last week, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in Jesus Christ who died for me and gave himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. We won't be bewitched by the evil eyes if Christ's love and sacrifice is like a billboard before us. Verse 2 of our text turns to the role of the Spirit. And this is the first time the Holy Spirit is mentioned here in the book of Galatians. And so what he's doing is he's saying, remember how the Spirit came into your lives. Remember when you were, you know, you learned the gospel, you heard the gospel, you believed the gospel, and the Holy Spirit came into your life. And so we sometimes forget what the Holy Spirit is. You know, we think of the Father, we think of the Son, but um, sometimes we forget the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a book Francis Chan wrote. It's actually called Forgotten God. I know one of our small groups has done a study of that book, and Forgotten God is it's the Holy Spirit because we just kind of lose touch on what, what does he do? What does the Holy Spirit do? And so just on the screen, we're going to do a lot more of the Holy Spirit in chapter 5 of Galatians, but why don't we put this up right now? Just kind of a quick, you know, just kind of a quick teaser for, for what we'll talk about later. The Holy Spirit leads believers. It can be grieved. He can be grieved by our sin. He reveals the mystery of the gospel, intercedes for us, baptizes, lives inside of us, indwells. It seals us in our salvation. It fills us, and it empowers Christians to live a life pleasing to God. The Holy Spirit is so, so much a part of the three, the three persons of the blessed Trinity. So these six rapid fire questions that he gives, right? He, he, Paul's writing and he says, boom, 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 right in a row, uh, over and over again. But the one that he repeats, if you noticed, was did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by believing what you heard. And he just comes back to that. How did the Spirit come to you? Did you do something? Did you work at it? Did you do some action? Or did you believe and then you were gifted with the Holy Spirit? And so this idea of the law to, to, to obey works of the law, it's going to be mentioned a lot in Galatians, especially here in chapters 3 and 4. So there's a lot to say about it, a lot of... Uh, points that we'll be learning about it uh, and, and why it was good, but also why it's bad and why it can be really, um, really destructive if, if it's lived out in the wrong way. Verse 3, he says, uh, you began by the Spirit, okay? Now are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? Are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? And I want to stop and talk about this word that is the Greek for flesh is sarx. S-A-R-X. And I, the reason I remember this word and I think it's important is because it sometimes gets translated as sin nature or your sinful nature. Where this gets a little confusing for us is because we have things in, in our lives that are, are the flesh, right? Like we have this stuff. We have our sensations that we call flesh. But he's talking about more. Sarks talks about more than just our physical sensations. Here's the problem. If you believe that Sarks is all evil, if you believe that, uh, I'm sorry, if you believe that flesh is all evil, okay, then anything that I do in my body now becomes sin, right? But we know from Scripture that God says that, that God created us good, he created us male and female in his image, and so we are good in that creation. And we know that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of the heavenly lights. So we're, we're, we're left with this kind of, as Christians, we're like, okay, there can be sins that we do in our flesh, but we also don't say that all of the flesh is evil. But what is wrong, what is evil, is the sin nature. So Sarks is 
the sin nature. In the time when this, this letter was written to the Galatian churches, the Greek philosophy was prevalent around the Mediterranean. And one of the things the Greeks said was, the body is evil and the spirit is good. Matter is evil, spirit is the intangible, that is good. And so they would they kind of have that philosophy. You see that in Buddhism. Buddhism is a, is a religion that says all pleasures and all you know, suffering is meant to just be ignored. What you need to do is get rid of that so you can simply become spirit. And that's not biblical. That's not what the Bible says. The sin nature is what we need to have Jesus die for. And the sin nature is what we need to have... Um, yeah, you know, to be transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit. So just to, just to kind of, I hope, illustrate this point of what exactly does the sarks mean? How is it not just your flesh? How is it also these spiritual things? You know, Jesus tells us that these sins, they come from inside. They come from the heart. So there's, uh, there's a list of these in Galatians chapter 5. And verses 19 to 20. We'll get to this at the end of the summer. But just real quickly, it says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sarks. The acts of the sarks are obvious. The sin nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you see how some of them are physical. Some of those are things that affect our bodies, but a lot of those aren't. So when we talk about the flesh, we're not just talking about our bodies. We're talking about that sin nature when the word sarks is used. So um, here he is saying that as you're trying to complete it by the works of your sarks, he's saying that... Um, your, um, that it's, they're trying to save themselves by their own efforts, by things that they can do in the body. And he's saying that is not how you receive the Spirit. It is the Spirit that came into you through faith, and it is the Spirit that is working in you through faith and will transform you by faith, not of what you can do on your own. Um, verse 4, he talks about these experiences. Maybe your Bible says suffering, or maybe at least in the footnote, it says, um, it says suffering, but it says, have you experienced so much in vain? And what's kind of cool about the, the dual meaning of this word experience and suffer is that it can mean the, the positive things of the Christian life, the things that we experience, you know, the, the blessings, the goodness, uh, the things we have as fellowship, God showing us his love, God filling us, but also it can mean sufferings, the hard things of the Christian life. Right? It doesn't just leave those out. So, so were those in vain? Were those hard times that you went through, were they in vain? Were all the good things that God did, was all that in vain? Or did it have a purpose? And so he's trying to say it was by the Spirit that these things happened, and so cherish them. They are things to be remembered. God's blessing in your life yesterday, last month, five years ago, it's to be remembered because it was real. It was the Spirit's work in your life if you're a Christian. And I think probably I can ask most of you, the times when you got closest to God, wasn't it when you struggled? Wasn't it when you, cha when you were challenged, when, when things really hurt? When you had no idea which way was up? and you were struggling, wasn't that the time that God showed himself faithful? So remember those things. Don't be led astray by these false teachers. Don't be bewitched. And then verse 5, he says, um, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? And this, this word, or this phrase, miracles among you, you can actually translate that word among as also within you. So you might think, well, miracles among us. Like, I don't know, what, what miracles have we seen today? You know, I didn't see any magic tricks happen up here on stage. You know, we think, when we think of miracles as being these big, showy kind of things, 
We do have those. We do have transformed lives. And that's where it says the miracles within you as well. Right? And so, yes, God can do miracles. And he does miracles. God also saves people. If God has saved you, that is a miracle. That he opened your eyes to see the beauty of Jesus Christ and he brought you to faith, that is a miracle. So you're sitting here today, many of you have put your faith in Christ and you can say, that is a miracle that was within me. And then there's another miracle that happens. It's that God's changing you. It's that God, through the Holy Spirit, is making you more like Jesus. You know that thing that a year ago you struggled with so much and now you're free. You remember that thing when you first became a Christian, you were just like, oh, there's no way I could ever live without that. Now you don't need it anymore. Sanctification is the, the fancy word that we use in the church for that. So salvation and sanctification are both supernatural works of God. That is supernatural. That is a miracle that God does. And, and these miracles, do they happen because you're worthy? Do they happen because you're good enough? No. They're happy be, they're, they happen because God gives it to you. That you just have to receive it. And then God works in you and through you. And you're changed because of it. Just something to reflect on. If you've read the Bible much and you've read about Jesus' life and you've read about his stories, think about his healings. And think about... The times that, you know, there's no, that I'm aware of, there's nobody that Jesus went up to and said, I'm going to heal you. I demand that you be healed, that I do a miracle. But there's an interaction. There's someone who comes to Jesus in faith, and then God blesses them. God does the work, but it's, it's that receiving of God's Holy Spirit through faith. So if we're trying to make ourselves worthy, that is a treadmill that we will never get off. We'll be just like that little hamster who just keeps running, keeps running, keeps running and doesn't get anywhere. Trying to be good enough, trying to make ourselves worthy when God says it's a free gift that you can receive. My grace, my Holy Spirit. Adopted by the Father. That's our second point. Let's read verses 6 and 7. Adopted by the Father. So... Father's your blank there. So also Abraham, okay, so was it, was it by the Spirit or was it by believing? Verse 6, so also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. So it's becoming a matter of identity and there's, there's a, a battle, you know, being waged for the identity of these, these new believers in Galatia. And these Judaizers have come in and they've tried to say, you need to go back to Abraham. You need to do the things the way Abraham told us to do it. It's, you got to be Jewish before you can be Christian. So you got to do these things that the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people did. So what they do is they go back to Abraham and they say, okay, in chapter 17 of Genesis, and we studied this last year as a church, so this should sound familiar for, for those of you who have been around for a while. Chapter 17, they say, uh, God tells Abram to be circumcised. And that's the sign of his, uh, his covenant with God. And then there's other things that happen, right? There's other acts of faith that he does with, with Abram, and he changes his name to Abraham. And then, um, you know, there's, there's this obedience that Abraham does. But Paul does something masterful here, okay? This is, this is really, you know, that's the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, but it's 4D chess. It's like, okay, Judaizers, I got you right here. Here's where it's going down right now. And he says, you want to go to chapter 17 of Genesis? Let's go back to chapter 15 of Genesis, all right? So go with me there. Um, we'll, put it, we'll put it up on the screen. Abram is tired of waiting for decades. You know how old he was, and the promise was you're going to have a child, and he's just like, no way, this can't happen. So this is one of the times this happened, this, this hard act of believing and patience and waiting by Abram. And so God took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. It was belief 
that made Abraham righteousness. God credited it to him as righteousness through faith. Was it when he got circumcised? When it was after he was going to sacrifice Isaac on the altar? The, the, the promised child here that he just, he just heard about in, in Genesis 15? No. It was before that he was made right. It's this credited, it's an accounting term. It's, it's to have a books for a business and everything is, everything is, is in the red. Every, you're bankrupt. I don't know if you guys heard a couple weeks ago, Rubio's declared bankruptcy. It's so sad. We, we got to save them, people. Um, but but what, I, what, I, what I wish could happen is I wish what could happen is, you know, someone would credit them with, with books in the black, that they would have the money that they need. They wouldn't be bankrupt anymore. And so that's the story of us. We are bankrupt before God. We are sinful. We are lost. And so when we put our faith in Jesus, he says, here's your new books. Here is the, the redemption that's been paid. And now you're a gazillion cabillionaire. Okay? That's your new state. You are righteous in Christ by the blood of of Christ. And here's the other crazy thing about this is was Abraham a Jew when he received when he believed and when he received this righteousness? No. He was from Ur. He was from Ur. He was from another land. He was some other guy. But he became the father of the Jewish nation through his faith. His belief. So that is the foundation. So Galatians, guess what? You know somebody else who wasn't a Jew? Abraham. So he just completely obliterates, completely obliterates the Judaizers' argument just like that through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's been passed down to us. This is a problem. This has been a problem. The Jews, you know, their identity was important. God did say, hey, you guys are my chosen people. You are special. They're, you know, that was a real thing. Oh, so the, the blank there, I think, was Galatians. I want to go to that next one. Do we get that? So Abraham and the Galatians were justified and received the Spirit through faith. So this was a problem. John the Baptist comes on the scene, right? Just a couple, couple quick ones from our, our, our gospel. John the Baptist comes on the scene, and everybody's like, okay, who's this new guy who's kind of stirring up these Jewish people, stewing up, stirring up some, you know, some trouble here? So the Pharisees and Sadducees go out to see him. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 9. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. He calls the Pharisees a brood of vipers. They have given the evil eye. They have distracted people from what's important, a relationship with God through faith that he can forgive and, he, and forgive all their sins and, and leads them on in righteousness, leads them on in good works. Instead, they've looked, um, he's, saying, he's saying, look away, look towards that. Don't look towards just your, your genes. Don't look just towards your history. There's more to your relationship with God than that. He says, I can make stones into children of Abraham. And figuratively, he does. He takes the Gentile people and says, okay, I'm going to bring you to faith. Jesus had the same issue. Jesus had the issue with the same fight with the Pharisees. Um, and he tells them that he was the true son of the father. And he says that if you're, you know, you're, you're calling someone else your father, then um, Jews, it's not God. You've, you're holding the hand of the wrong daddy. Is basically, I don't, have any of you ever had that with like little kids? Uh, maybe it's your kids or somebody else's kids and you're kind of in a crowd and like a little kid just reaches up and grabs your hand and you're like, what are you doing, kid? Like, I'm not your dad or I'm not your mom, you know? And then they look up and they're petrified. just like, what did I just do? Like, where's my mommy? Where's my daddy? You know, it's kind of like that. He's saying, you know, you Pharisees, you took your eye off of God, the Father, and you're, you know, we don't, you know, well, this is what Jesus says. I'll let, I'll let him say it. Abraham is our father. Verse 39 of John chapter 8. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did, right? Believe, walk with God by faith, obey God through faith, and not in your own works. Verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil. 
You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. They weren't obeying the true father through faith. And so instead, they're following a snake, a liar. They were bewitched. And so the Judaizers maybe weren't quite as bad as the Pharisees, but they still didn't get it. They still didn't have the freedom in Christ um, that, that God wanted them to have. It was a new identity. He wants us to have a new identity, and that's what Jesus came to give us. He came to make us new. And so next blank on your outline is the devil attacks your identity in Christ because your behaviors will follow your identity. What you think about God and then what you think about your identity to God, your, your relationship to God, will affect the way you behave. If uh, you think you're a slave to sin, if you think you can't change, if you think you can't do it, then you won't be able to do it. But if our identity is in Christ, then that makes us know the truth. We hold on to the truth, what God says about us. To use J.B. Phillips' language, if you identify as an idiot, you will act like an idiot. But you are free. You are set free, Christian, to live in freedom and joy. And so that's where we're going we're gonna to pause right here and we're going we're gonna to say, are we, what is our identity? Are we bewitched by anything in our lives? Has our identity been, you know, as a snake, go ahead and put the next slide, has a snake charmed us like poor Mowgli? Poor Mowgli who the eyes, the evil eye has just taken his focus off and has, has deceived him. It could, be, it could be your children, right? We love our children so much as parents. Our children could be that thing that we, we ground our identity in. Or it could be our family. You know, there's a lot of great families in this church, and it could be that my family is where I get my sense of identity. Definitely spouses, you know? Again, a lot of love that we have for them, but that identity can be wrapped up in them or a significant other, you know, if you're engaged or you're dating someone, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's pretty intoxicating, but it can be bewitching. Changing gears a little bit, is it, is it jobs? Like, is your identity in your work? You know, it's one of the things, you know, first thing you meet somebody, hey, how you doing? Yeah, what do you do? You know, is that identity what you define yourself as or is your identity in Christ? Is your identity in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you? Is it in popularity, intelligence? Is it, is it something in finances, right? We need money to live, and, and so we, but we can get obsessed with our finances, our retirement goals, or can we save up to buy a house, right? It's been said that there are two religions in the world. Only two religions in the world. One of them is human achievement, and the other one is divine accomplishment. Let's think about human achievement as a, as a whole category of religions. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of other religions, but let's just start with the first one, human achievement. It can be that through your religion, you are trying to achieve rightness with God. You could say, Here's, here today, we have to check ourselves because we can say, I've come, to, uh, I've, I've come to JCC 50 Sundays out of the year. I woke up every morning for the last 33 days and read my Bible, and we can say, I have achieved this. I have done it. I have worked out my salvation. And so we, we even as religious people, can be worshiping at this wrong idol of, of this wrong God of human achievement you know and it it feels good it feels good to be able to say look what I did today look how I did this look at me and there's a sense of pride and fulfillment from that um, sometimes we use those good works to even like kind of like make a little little checklist you know for God you know like remember God when I did that now how about I get this God how about you do this for me because I've been doing this for you and we say, instead of remembering it's all grace, it's all God, it's all what he just generously gives us. Um, so it's, it's, it's tempting. Legalism is very, 
It's very tempting. It's very bewitching to say that I can do it on my own. And then, of course, you think of the, you know, Islam, the five pillars of Islam, right? You do these things, you're going to be saved. Judaism, you know, follow the law, you're going to be saved. Uh, Buddhism, the eight po- eightfold path to enlightenment, right? Do these things, you'll be saved. Human achievement is one, one religion. And there's a lot of different lanes in that religion, but it all ultimately is the same thing. Non-religious people also use human achievement. They set up altars to work, or a house, or a family, or power. Human achievement comes in many forms. Even people who say, well, we don't believe in God. Well, we're atheists. They worship at the altar of human achievement. This is how I make myself right in this world. There's a second way. And divine accomplishment is that second way. And only the gospel offers this. Only the truth about Jesus Christ offers this second way. And it says that Jesus did it all. We, we keep talking about it. And I, I didn't come up with this, but we keep using this phrase because I find it so I find it so powerful, is that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing. You can't add anything to him. It's all been done for you. Divine accomplishment. And Jesus plus anything else, any kind of human achievement, equals nothing. Jesus alone. And so that's just the question that I hope you're wrestling with right now. Where are you identifying today? Are you identifying with the Savior and the free gift of grace. Maybe today, this is one of the first times you've, ident- you've, you've wrestled with that question and you've realized, yeah, I've been looking this direction. I've been putting that idol up or that idol up and I've, I've had these different things that t- I, I haven't trusted in Jesus alone. I've thought that I can just do a little bit more and I can get there on my own. Our last point then is number three, is that we, are, we can be redeemed by the Son, and we are redeemed by the Son. Verses 8 and 9, just wrapping up. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. That's Jesus. Through the seed of Abraham came Jesus Christ Verse 9, so those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. So how did Scripture foresee the Gentile salvation? And how did, they, how did Scripture foresee the gospel coming, the good news coming, God's redemption? Through prophecy. There's over 300 prophecies that pointed to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So over 300. Some scholars would say 600 they, they look at certain ones differently. There's, you know, there's debate. But it's the prophecy that we see throughout our Old Testament. And so the Old Testament didn't just exist for those prophecies, but that was a big part of what it did, um, was to tell us and point us to Jesus. And I mention this a lot because I think it's so amazing. When, when uh, Genesis chapter 3, when sin had first entered into the world, and we're just like, no, it's all gone wrong. And we're reading, how could you, Adam? How could you, Eve? Oh, that serpent. We're all just devastated. And God speaks and he gives the proto-evangelium, which means the first gospel is right there, right after our first sin. God says there's hope. And he says, I will put enmity. He says this to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head you will strike his heel. He will crush your head. The son to come, the one to come, would be the one who would undo the works of death and evil and sin. He would strike the heel, right? He, he, Jesus had to die, and Satan had, had that on his, his record. But he would crush Satan's head, and we get that promise right at the beginning. And so every woman in the Old Testament Every child that came forth, it was that hope of, is this the one? Is this the one who will redeem Israel? And they were just looking forward to that. And that's the story of the Old Testament. Who will be the Messiah? When will he come? And even today, Jews are looking for a Messiah to come. 
We know that he came. There's another, another great place, a book of prophecy, just where the Gentiles come into this. How did, how did the Galatians have hope here? Well, the Gentiles come into this. Um, Isaiah 49, verse 6. He's predicting about the Messiah, and this is what it says. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes. He's talking about the servant, the Messiah, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And that's where we are today. Many of us are Gentile believers in Jesus Christ, and we are taking the message as a church and as individuals to the ends of the earth. We are still part of that promise and that mandate. When you think about the Old Testament, and we're, again, we're going to talk a lot more about the law. There's going to be a lot. You know, it's great that we're doing Galatians right after Genesis because there's so many of these references to, uh, to what we just read in Genesis. We're going, to, we're going to see more about it. But the question that a lot of times people have is, how did God save people before Jesus came? Right? I don't know if you've had that question before. I definitely have. How did God save people before Jesus came? Was everybody before Jesus, did they all go to hell? Because there's no Jesus to save them? They were saved by grace through faith in God, one day providing their salvation. They were looking ahead, but it was by grace and it was through faith. It was never by the law. What was the law? The law was them uh, showing their faith in God, them agreeing to God's covenant with them and saying, yes, God, you have done this. You, you will do this one day. You will provide salvation. And now we say, hallelujah, Jesus has come. Hallelujah. It is by grace we are saved by grace alone, as our, as our signs say, as our theme says. The Old Testament is going to talk about um, verses. It's going, to talk, it's going to talk about sacrifices and offerings, and it's going to say, you probably can think of some, where it's like, wait a second. It says, you know, in Psalms, doesn't it say, like, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire? Like, well, then why does he tell us to do it? They're not going to save, but what they do is they show a faith relationship, and they show that there's trust in God providing it all on his, on his strength, all on his divine accomplishment. And so, yes, some people, the Pharisees, those Judaizers, they lost the way. They thought it was, they could do it. They thought they could do it by their works. They thought they could achieve it. But God brings, brings us back again and again, and that's the beauty of Galatians. It brings us back to the freedom that we have in Christ. So as we wrap up, what is our billboard? What is your billboard this morning that's going to keep you from being bewitched by these these other things along the side of the road that are going to, uh, you know, not make you go back to your idols. That are not going to say, well, I got to do this and I got to do that. And God says, follow me and you will be changed. You will do good works, right? Ephesians 2.10. We, we were created to do good works in Jesus Christ, but he's the one preparing them. And it's by grace, Ephesians 2.8 told us, that we are saved. The free grace of Christ on the cross is what sets us free. Let's, let's keep him the billboard in front of us. And we're going to sing now the great lyrics of uh, a wonderful song. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. And on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died take away my sin. You pray with me. Father, you are wonderful. You have done it all, God, and we just want to put our trust in you more today, God. And Lord, if there's anybody today that hasn't done that, they haven't just surrendered everything to you and trusted that you you are their only hope of righteousness, the work that you did on the cross, your love for them, your sacrifice. God, we pray that today you would move. God, it is a miracle when anyone is saved. And so, God, we ask now as your people that you would do that miracle in someone's life today. And God, we thank you for the miracle that you've done in our lives and the miracle that you're continue, continuing to do through your Holy Spirit. God, we can't do it on our own, but you can. <sighs> And you can do it perfectly, and we just, 
We just want to love you more, and we just want to follow you more and serve you more and obey you, Lord, not out of our own attempts to be good and make ourselves righteous, God, but just because you love us and you have made us righteous through our faith. We thank you, Father, and we say you are great, Lord. That word just doesn't do it justice how great you are. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.